Yes. And it's all right from time to time if you doubt it, as long as you remain faithful and hold fast to your belief. Because in the church of God, doubters are welcome. If you have your Bible, I would like you to turn to the Gospel of Matthew. It is there in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, verse 1 through 5, that we will extract today's message. I will read from Matthew chapter 11, verse 1 through 5, and I will read from the New International Version. Those who are present, I encourage you to stand. And as those who are able, whether online or in person, please feel free to stand with us as we read the New International Version of Matthew chapter 11, verse 1 through 5. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and what you see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear and the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Now Lord, behind the shadows of the cross, let your voice be heard, let your name be lifted up. Your precious name. Amen. We have all experienced moments in life where we found it difficult to believe something or someone. We all have doubts from time to time. You know, that feeling of uncertainty uncertainty about something or someone. In today's title message, Doubters Welcome, let's take a moment and examine the nature of doubt. As we approach this topic, we need to understand several things up front. Some people think doubt is the opposite of faith, but it isn't. Unbelief is the opposite of faith. Belief refers to a willful refusal to believe, while doubt refers to inner uncertainty. 
other people think doubt is unforgivable, but it isn't unforgivable. God doesn't condemn us when we question him. Both Job and David repeatedly questioned God, but they were not condemned. God is big enough to handle all our doubts and all our questions. Many people think that struggling with the promises of God indicates a lack of faith. But that also is not true. Struggling with God is a sure sign that we, are, that we truly have faith. If we never struggle, brothers and sisters, if we never struggle, our faith will never grow. So what exactly is the definition of doubt? Doubt is defined as a feeling of uncertainty or a lack of conviction. There are different categories of doubt. So let's look at a few. There is intellectual doubt. Intellectual doubt deals with what you know. It focuses on facts rather than emotion. Although intellectual doubt can cause some emotions, it doesn't usually embrace emotion. The source of doubt is intellectual, while the effect of the doubt is emotional. Then there is emotional doubt. Emotional doubt is caused by an emotional impact related to an event or a situation. For example, when people experience deep relational conflicts with loved ones, the emotional impact causes them to question the feeling of being loved and cared for. There are times when the intellectual and the emotional doubts are combined. In this case, some psychologist calls it psychological doubt. Psychological doubt can, can best be explained with an example. A person who has a phobia of flying. The person may know everything there is to know about flight safety and know intellectually that flying on an airplane is by almost every matrix safer than driving in a car. And yet, the person will still doubt the reasonable, reasonableness of getting them on the plane. Circumstantial doubt is the question of your belief system, your standards, your principles, especially when certain circumstances occur that lead you to do so. In other words, you may believe that we live in a society that has a commitment to fairness and justice. But when we see the killings of unarmed black and brown men and women, we may question whether the United States of America is truly a place of equal justice, equal opportunity for all. That is circumstantial doubt. And then there is reasonable doubt, an expression you usually hear in the legal system. Reasonable doubt is when a jury cannot say with moral certainty that a person is guilty of an offense. And there is self-doubt, which is a lack of confidence in oneself and one's ability. Self-doubt leaves you feeling insecure, displaying a lack of confidence in your ability. Self-doubt is something that most of us will go through at some point in our life's journey. 
leads us right down to spiritual doubt. Spiritual doubt is question God's love, goodness, or God's very existence altogether. It's lack of confidence in God. When circumstances such as unexpected loss of a loved one, the killing of innocent children happen, people doubt their belief in an all-loving God. But regardless of how we categorize doubt, the nature of doubt is uncertainty. Regardless of how we categorize it, the nature of doubt remains the same. It's uncertainty, lack of conviction. Doubt itself, by the way, is not wrong. Yet doubt can leave us mentally fatigued. It can negatively impact us by preventing us from obtaining success and gaining self-confidence. But doubt also can serve as a catalyst for growth. Yes, it has the ability to aid in character development. It, it, it has the potential for us to, to gain knowledge and, and, and gain conviction and self-confidence. But let's get a biblical perspective on doubt. Let us focus on one man and the way Jesus dealt with that man's doubt. I would like to focus on the doubt of John the Baptist. As we read in our sermonic text, John the Baptist was confused and frustrated by his imprisonment. So John sent messengers to Jesus. He says to his disciples, go find Jesus and, and inquire of him. Are you the one who was to come? Or should we expect someone else? Now, keep in mind, John knew who Jesus was. Most everyone, believer and non-believers alike, had heard of John the Baptist. He is one of the most significant and well-known figures in the Bible. While John was known as the Baptist, he was in fact the first prophet called by God since Malachi some 400 years earlier. John's coming from was foretold over 700 years previously by another prophet. That prophet called out and said, there's a voice of one calling in the desert prepare the way for the Lord. There is a voice of one who is calling to make straight in the wilderness a highway for God. There is the voice of one calling, every valley shall rise up, every mountain and hill made low, that the, the rough ground shall be leveled, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all the people together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Isaiah 40, verse 3 and 5, verse 3 through 5 tells us that there's a prophet named Isaiah who predicted that there would be a John the Baptist preparing the way for the Messiah. This message, this passage illustrates God's master plan in action as selected, who, who, who selected John to be his special ambassador to proclaim his own coming. John's adult life was characterized by devotion and surrender to Jesus Christ and his kingdom. John's voice was a lone voice in the wilderness. As he proclaimed the coming of the Messiah to, to people who desperately needed a savior. He was a man filled with faith. John the Baptist's ministry grew in popularity as recounted in Matthew chapter 
3, verse 5, people went out from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. And brothers and sisters, to be baptized by John was to admit your sin and repent from it. John the Baptist wholeheartedly believed in Jesus. John the Baptist knew the Messiah was coming. John the Baptist believed that this was the time for redemption. This was the time for deliverance. With his whole heart, he spent his days preparing the way for the Lord's coming. But the road was not an easy one to prepare. Daily, he faced doubters who did not share his enthusiasm for the coming of the Lord. John steadfastly believed in Jesus as the Messiah. In fact, when Jesus approached him, John said to those standing by, look at the Lamb of God. He takes away the sins of the world. Now John the Baptist sits in prison. According to the New Testament, Herod Antipas, ruler of Galilee, had imprisoned John the Baptist because he had publicly reproved Herod for divorcing his wife and taking his sister-in-law, yes, his brother's wife, as his second wife. So John the Baptist spoke out against such evil and such sin. It is no wonder that John, languishing in prison, not knowing if or when he would be released, began to doubt. While it is hard to know for sure what John was feeling as he sat in prison, he did certainly seem to have doubts. But John sent a message out to Jesus in an effort to find the truth, to find what, everybody? He sent a message out to find the, the truth. As Christians, our faith will be put to the test. Our faith will be challenged. And we will either falter in our faith or, like John, cling to Jesus, seek truth, and stand firm in our faith till the end. How could John the Baptist, so certain that Jesus was the coming Redeemer, Messiah, and Deliverer, how could John the Baptist, who was certain that Jesus was the man, now sits in prison and have doubts? But you know, he said in prison he had doubts, but at least John knew. He knew enough to ask the right questions. He told his followers, his disciples, go find Jesus and ask the question, are you the one sent from heaven? Or is there someone else who will be our savior? Are you really the promised Messiah? That's what John wanted to know. Mm, the answer of the Lord Jesus gave was very instructive. He did not rebuke John or put him down. No, no, no. Jesus simply gave John the evidence he needed to neutralize his uncertainty and strengthen his confidence in Jesus as the Messiah. Jesus said to, to John the Baptist's disciples, go back, is what Jesus said, and tell John what you have seen. Tell John what you witness. Tell John that the blind can see, the lame can walk, the lepers are cured, the deaf can hear. Oh, tell John the dead have been brought back to life. Tell John the poor have uh, the gospel preached to them. 
Jesus is essentially, essentially saying, go back and tell John that, that my name is being proclaimed, that my message is being delivered, and that the hurting people of the world are being totally transformed. It is as if Jesus is saying, John, you may doubt me, but I don't doubt you. Jesus knew that underneath John's doubt was genuine faith. And perhaps this is why, brothers and sisters, every church should have a sign that says, Doubters, welcome. Oh, I preach the gospel of Jesus, the good news of the Bible for doubters like me. If you have doubts, read your Bible. If you have questions, read your Bible. If you are uncertain, read your Bible. If you are a skeptic, read your Bible. If you are searching for truth, read your Bible. Doubters have its use. Because doubt is often the prelude to even deeper faith. Oh, brothers and sisters, doubt is not sinful. Doubting is not sinful. But it can be dangerous. And it can lead to sin. It can also spur enormous spiritual growth. It is what you do with your doubt. That matters. What you do with your doubt makes all the difference in how you view the world. What you do with your doubt makes all the difference in how you respond to those moments of uncertainty, how you respond to those moments where you lack conviction. It's what you do with doubt that counts. May I just make Four recommendation what to do with doubt. First one, express your doubts and ask for help. That's what John the Baptist did. God is not fragile. God is strong enough to handle your doubts, your fears, your worries, and your unanswered questions. God is a big God. He runs the universe without any help. He doesn't need our help to keep the cosmos active and in existence. Your doubts won't upset him. Tell him your doubts. Cry out and ask for help. Don't fight it alone. Go to a trustworthy friend. You know that friend that stick it closer than a brother or a sister? Go to a friend. Go to a pastor or go to anyone with unwavering faith. Go to someone who has confidence in God and someone who may have godly insight. Ask this person to pray with you, to walk with you as you face your doubts. Oh, I encourage you, brothers and sisters, to express your doubts and ask for help. Second thing we should probably do in responding to, to our lack of doubt is act on your faith, not on your doubts. Act on your faith, not on your doubts. That's what Noah did when he built the ark. That's what Abraham did when he left Earl of the Chaldeans uh, and when he was told to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. Act on your faith, not your doubts. That's what Moses did when he marched through the Red Sea on dry ground. That's what David did when he faced Goliath. That's what Joshua did when he marched around Jericho. That's what Daniel did when he was thrown into the lion's den. That's what Nehemiah did when he rebuilt the wall. Act on your faith, not on your doubt. Do you think? These great heroes of faith 
didn't that have their doubts? They had their doubts. And of course, they had doubts, but they acted on faith. They did not know in advance how everything was going to turn out. No. But they, they, they took a deep breath like we can. They decided to trust God like we can. And acted on their faith instead of their doubts. If we would do the same thing, our faith will continually grow. And get stronger. Another thing we can do, brothers and sisters, in responding to doubt, is question your doubt, not your faith. This simply means that you should not cast away your faith simply because you are in the valley of darkness. Because all of us, all of us walk into the valley of darkness from time to time. In fact, some of us spend a great deal of time in the valley of darkness because we keep walking through the valley of, of darkness, but we need to just keep on walking. When, when you find yourself in the valley where all is uncertain, when you find yourself in the valley of unemployment, when you find yourself in the valley of insufficient funds to pay your bills, when you find yourself in the valley of no food on your table, the valley of no roof over your head, the valley of loneliness, and you are tempted to give up and to give in to your doubts, to give in to your fears and worries. Remember to... Press on, <laughs> press through, <laughs> press forward in your faith. Ah, don't give in to your doubts. Re-engage with your faith. Oh, re-engage and reconnect to what you know is true. After all, considering the suffering of this life, and the pearls and tribulations of following Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul triumphantly concludes Romans 8 by declaring, For I am persuaded to press towards the mark. For I am persuaded that nothing in the cosmos, <laughs> I am persuaded Nothing in all of the universe, nothing in this world will separate me from the love of God. Can you press forward? Can you re-engage with Jesus in your life? Can you accept, like Paul, and be persuaded that nothing, no one will ever separate you from the love of God? Oh, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, the Apostle Paul declares, I know in whom I believe. Oh, I echo the sentiments of the Apostle Paul. The God I believe in is an all-inclusive God. My God is an omnipotent God. My God is is an omniscient God. My God is an omnipresent God. My God is an omnipenevolent God. My God, my God, my God is pure love. And my God is God. Brothers and sisters, I came by to tell you today, like John the Baptist, you can come to Jesus with your doubt. You can come to Jesus with skepticism, with your unbeliefs. Come to Jesus with your hard questions and with your uncertainties. Jesus welcomes all of them. Doubt is not wrong. Doubt is not sinful. Doubt is inevitable. It is a part of life's process and journey on earth but it is 
what you do with doubt that makes all the difference in your life. When you experience doubt, connect and commune and with someone both human and divine. Don't struggle with your doubts by yourself. Go to a trusted friend. Go to a trusted companion. Go to someone who offers compassion. Talk to. Go to Jesus. Bring your doubts with you. God will not turn you away because at the throne of God's grace, doubters are welcome. Oh, thank you, Lord, for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for your presence. We thank you, Lord, because you never give up on us. And no matter how we may doubt in any category of doubt, no matter how uncertain we are, you, dear Lord, are a God of certainty, a God of conviction, a God that makes all the difference in the world if we hold on to you, if we trust you, and if we come to you with all of our doubts. We thank you for welcome, welcoming us as doubters. We thank you, Lord. Amen and hallelujah and amen. <laughs>